Welcome to the Banner of Truth magazine podcast, where each week we bring you selected content from the magazine for your encouragement and edification. For the next three weeks on the podcast, we're going to do a mini-series of sorts on the subject of the public worship of God. Most of us, if we're honest, need help in this area. We tend to think, and our culture reinforces this, that the most important things that we do are things that we do for ourselves, or even by ourselves. But the Lord calls His people to prize His worship, learning from and imitating His own delight in our service of Him. This week, then, we'll look at the priority of public worship. Next week, we'll consider the subject of children and public worship. And then the week after that, we'll look at the area of evening worship on the Lord's Day. Now, as we move to consider the priority of public worship, we'll read an article from Warren Peel, one of the trustees of the Banner of Truth, who now ministers in Galway in Ireland. In this article, Warren introduces us to a seminal sermon from the Puritan David Clarkson. This piece first appeared in issue 722 of the magazine, November 2023. How would you answer the following questions? How can we most glorify God on the earth? How can we experience most of his presence? How can we see him? most clearly revealed? How can we get the maximum possible spiritual benefits from the Lord? How can we do the greatest good to our fellow believers? What is the best antidote to backsliding and apostasy? Where can we experience the Lord doing his greatest works on earth? What is the closest experience to heaven we can get in this world? I wonder what you might suggest. These are not trivial questions. Surely every true child of God should be keenly interested in their answers. But I wonder how many of us would be surprised at the answer. Because the answer is actually the same for each of them. At least according to the Puritan pastor David Clarkson, who ministered in London in the 1680s. First as the great John Owen's assistant, and then as his successor. The answer says Clarkson, is the public worship services of your church. Was that your answer? Go to worship with your congregation on the Lord's Day? I wonder how many Christians today would say that going to church is the best way to accomplish all those things. Clarkson's thesis is based on Psalm 87 2. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. His point was that the Lord delights in the public worship of his gathered people in Jerusalem even more than their private worship as individuals or families in the dwelling places of Jacob. Since the death and resurrection of Christ, in the New Testament, the people of God are the living stones comprising the temple of God, built upon Christ as the chief cornerstone, 1 Corinthians 3.16, Ephesians 2.21 and following, 1 Peter 2.5. So, the gates of Zion today are found wherever a true church gathers to worship the triune God in spirit and in truth. And the Lord delights in that worship even more than in all our personal devotions. This does not mean that God does not love it when we read the Bible and pray to him on our own. Rather, that he loves our public gathering for worship even more. Clarkson gives 12 biblical arguments for why public worship should be even more pleasing to God than private. I'll list them at the end. His challenge is clear simple, and even more relevant today than it was in the 17th century. As it is with the Lord, so should it be with his people. If the Lord delights most in public worship, so should his people. Is this true for us? If public worship is the most spiritually significant, momentous thing we can do on earth, 
Is it any wonder that the devil attacks it more than anything else? We are constantly tempted to devalue the public worship services of our church for all kinds of reasons. Perhaps through individualism. What really matters is what I do on my own. It is all about what God says to me personally. Perhaps it is through pride. I can look after myself spiritually. I don't need pastors, elders, deacons and other Christians. For some, the temptation might lie in self-preservation. Maybe you've been badly hurt by other Christians and you want to protect yourself by withdrawing from church life. For others, it could be arrogance. We don't like being challenged about our sins. Our itching ears want to hear only nice, pleasant, encouraging things. Perhaps you're a bit of an introvert, and you find it exhausting and daunting to be among people. Even the best churches are messy, frustrating places. If you put a lot of sinners, even sinners who are being sanctified, in one place together, there always are going to be problems. People will say insensitive things. There will be different perspectives. There will be weak and immature Christians to deal with. It would be so much easier to stay at home and avoid it altogether. And then we have the lure of online, quote, church. The vast majority of us had to sacrifice public worship during the months of lockdown and make do with an online substitute. But perhaps over the weeks and months, many Christians started to prefer it to the real thing. After all, it was very convenient. No need to dress up, no commute to a building, just a few steps to your living room. You could visit any church in the world. If you want to listen to a better preacher than your own pastor, sermon audio alone has 34,891 speakers and 1,974,764 sermons to click on. If you're not gripped by one message, click to something different. If it's too hard, or too light, or too dry, or too challenging, find something else. No wonder many churches are worried that people will not only work from home now that the COVID restrictions are lifted, but will want to worship from home as well. Perhaps most readers are unlikely to give in to that temptation, but we do need to guard our hearts and remind ourselves that the public worship of God is the most important thing we can ever do, and that it's there that we will find most blessing. So, I commend Clarkson's sermon to you as a great antidote to the temptation to downplay the importance of public worship, and as a tremendous way to prepare for returning to public worship if you haven't already done so. You can read it in the collected works of David Clarkson, published by the Banner of Truth Trust. There is also a useful outline of his 12 reasons why public worship is to be preferred to private, produced by Kensit Evangelical Church in London, and included at the end of this article. Alternatively, why not take the first six reasons to meditate on and pray through in your own devotions or family worship, Monday to Saturday of one week, and then the next six the following week? Here then is a summary of Clarkson's 12 reasons why public worship is to be preferred over private. 1. The Lord is more glorified by public worship than private. God is glorified by us when we acknowledge that he is glorious, and he is most glorified when this acknowledgement is most public. 2. There is more of the Lord's presence in public worship than in private. He is present with his people in the use of public worship in a special way, more effectually, constantly, and intimately. 3. God manifests himself more clearly in public worship than in private. For example, in Revelation, Christ is manifested in the midst of the churches. 4. There is more spiritual advantage in the use of public worship. 
Whatever spiritual benefit is to be found in private duties, that and much more may be expected from public worship when rightly used. 5. Public worship is more edifying than private. In private, you provide for your own good, but in public, you do good both to yourselves and others. 6. Public worship is a better security against apostasy than private. He who lacks or rejects public worship, whatever private means he enjoys, is in danger of apostasy. 7. The Lord works his greatest works in public worship. Conversion, regeneration, etc. are usually accomplished through public means. 8. Public worship is the nearest semblance of heaven. In the Bible's depictions of heaven, there is nothing done in private, nothing in secret. All the worship of that glorious company is public. 9. The most renowned servants of God have preferred public worship to private. The Lord Jesus, when he walked on the earth, did not withdraw from the public ordinances, though they were corrupt. Public worship was more precious to the apostles than their safety, liberty, and lives. 10. Public worship is the best means for procuring the greatest mercies and preventing and removing the greatest judgments. 11. The precious blood of Christ is most interested in public worship. Private worship was required of and performed by Adam and his posterity, even in a sinless state. But the public preaching of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments have a necessary dependence on the death of Christ. 12. The promises of God are given more to public worship than to private. There are more promises to public than to private worship, and even the promises that seem to be made to private duties are applicable and more powerful for public worship. Let's take a closer look at a selection of David Clarkson's arguments here. Number one, the Lord is more glorified by public worship than private. Clarkson writes, God is then glorified by us when we acknowledge that he is glorious. And he is most glorified when this acknowledgement is most public. This is obvious. A public acknowledgement of the worth and excellency of anyone tends more to his honour than that which is private or secret. It was more for David's honour that the multitude did celebrate his victory, 1 Samuel 28, 7, than if a particular person had acknowledged it only in private. Hence the psalmist, when he would have the glory of God most amply declared, contents not himself with a private acknowledgement, but summons all the earth to praise him. Psalm 66, 1-3 then is the Lord most glorified, when his glory is most declared. And then it is most declared, when it is declared by most, by a multitude. David shows the way whereby God may be most glorified. Psalm 22, 22, 23, 25. Then he appears all glorious when publicly magnified, when he is praised in the great congregation. Then he is most glorified when a multitude speaks of and to his glory. Psalm 29, 9. In his temple does everyone speak of his glory. The Lord complains as if he had no honor from his people when his public worship is despised, neglected. Malachi 1, 6. If I be a father, where is mine honour? If I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord God of hosts unto you, O priests that despise my name. By name of God here is meant his worship and ordinances, as plainly appears by what follows. 
verses 7, 8, and 11. And he here expostulates with them as tendering him no honour, because they despised his worship and ordinances. Then shall Christ be most glorified, when he shall be admired in all them that believe, in that great assembly at the last day. 2 Thessalonians 1.10 And it holds in proportion now. The more there are who join together in praising, admiring, and worshipping him, the more he is glorified, and therefore more in public than in private. Let's continue on with his second argument. There is more of the Lord's presence in public worship than in private. He writes, He is present with his people in the use of public ordinances in a more especial manner, more effectually, constantly, intimately. For the first, see Exodus 20, 24. After he had given instructions for his public worship, he adds, In all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. Where I am publicly worshipped, for the name of God is frequently put for the worship of God, I will come. And not empty-handed, I will bless thee. A comprehensive word, including all that is desirable all that tends to the happiness of those that worship him. Here is the efficacy. For the constancy of his presence, see Matthew 28. I am with you always, to the end of the world. Where, after he had given order for the administration of public ordinances, he concludes with that sweet encouragement to the use of them. I am with you always, every day and that to the end of the world. Here is the constancy. See the intimacy of his presence. Matthew eighteen twenty, Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. He says not, I am near them, or with them, or about them, but in the midst of them, as much intimacy as can be expressed. And so he is described, Revelation 1.13, to be in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, in the midst of the church. There he walks, and there he dwells, not only with them, but in them. For so the apostle, 2 Corinthians 6.16, renders that of Leviticus 26.12 which promise he made upon presupposal of his tabernacle, his public worship amongst them. Verse 11. Here it is that when the public worship of God is taken from a people, then God is departed. His presence is gone. As she, when the ark was taken from the Israelites, cried out, The glory is departed. And why? but because the Lord, who is the glory of his people, is then departed. Public ordinances are the sign, the pledge of God's presence, and in the use of them he does in a special manner manifest himself present. But you will say, Is not the Lord present with his servants when they worship him in private? It is true. But so much of his presence is not vouchsafed, nor ordinarily enjoyed, in private as in public. If the experience of any find it otherwise, they have cause to fear the Lord is angry. They have given him some distaste, some offence, if they find him not most, where ordinarily he is most to be found. And this is in public ordinances. For the Lord is most there where he is most engaged to be. But he has engaged himself to be most there where most of his people are. The Lord has engaged to be with every particular saint. But when the particulars are joined in public worship, there are all the engagements united together. The Lord engages himself to let forth, as it were, a stream of his comfortable, quickening presence to every particular person that fears him. But when many of these particulars join together to worship God, 
then these several streams are united and meet in one. So that the presence of God, which, enjoyed in private, is but a stream, in public becomes a river, a river that makes glad the city of God. The Lord has a dish for every particular soul that truly serves him. But when many particulars meet together, there is a variety, a confluence, a multitude of dishes. The presence of the Lord in public worship makes it a spiritual feast, and so it is expressed, Isaiah 25, 6. There is, you see, more of God's presence in public worship. Therefore, public worship is to be preferred before private. Let's skip on ahead now to his sixth argument, which perhaps is an argument we would not think much about. Argument number six. Public ordinances are a better security against apostasy than private, and therefore to be preferred. An argument worthy our observation in these backsliding times. He that lacks the public ordinances, whatever private means he enjoy, is in danger of apostasy. David was as much in the private duties of God's worship as any while he was in banishment. Yet, because he was thereby deprived of the public ordinances, he looked upon himself as in great danger of idolatry. Which is plain from his speech, 1 Samuel 26, 19. They have driven me out this day from abiding in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go, serve other gods. There was none about Saul so profane as to say expressly unto David, Go, serve other gods. Why then does David thus charge them? Why, but because by banishing him from the inheritance of the Lord and the public ordinances, which were the best part of that inheritance, they exposed him to temptations which might draw him to idolatry and deprive him of that which was his great security against it. They might as well have said plainly, go and serve other gods, as drive him out from the public worship of the true God, which he accounted the sovereign preservative from idolatry. But we have too many instances nearer home to confirm this. Is not the rejecting of public ordinances the great step to the woeful apostasies amongst us? Who is there falls off from the truth and holiness of the gospel into licentious opinions and practices who has not first fallen off from the public ordinances? Who is there in these times that has made shipwreck of faith and a good conscience who has not first cast the public worship of God overboard? The sad issue of forsaking the public assemblies, too visible in the apostasy of diverse professors, should teach us this truth, that public ordinances are the great security against apostasy a greater security than private duties, and therefore to be preferred. For this end were they given, that we might not be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Ephesians 4.14 No wonder if those that reject the means fall so woefully short of the end. No wonder if they be tossed to and fro, till they have nothing left but wind and froth. This was the means which Christ prescribed to the church, that she might not turn aside to the flocks of those companions, hypocrites, or idolaters. Song of Songs 1. Feed by the shepherd's tents. No wonder if those who shun those tents become a prey to wolves and foxes, to seducers and the destroyer. Public ordinances are a more effectual means to preserve from apostasy, and therefore to be preferred before private. And let's read reason number eight. Public worship is the nearest resemblance of heaven, therefore to be preferred. Clarkson explains, In heaven, so far as the scripture describes it to us, there is nothing done in private nothing in secret. All the worship of that glorious company 
is public. The innumerable company of angels and the church of the firstborn make up one general assembly in the heavenly Jerusalem. Hebrews 12, 22 and 23. They make one glorious congregation and so jointly together sing the praises of him that sits on the throne and the praises of the Lamb and continue employed in this public worship to eternity. The last one we'll look at is reason number 11. The precious blood of Christ is most interested in public worship, and that must needs be most valuable, which has most interest in that which is of infinite value. The blood of Christ has most influence upon public worship, more than on private. For the private duties of God's worship, private prayers, meditation, and such like, had been required of, and performed by, Adam and his posterity, if he had continued in the state of innocency. They had been due by the light of nature, if Christ had never died, if life and immortality had never been brought to light by the gospel. But the public preaching of the gospel and the administration of the federal seals have a necessary dependence upon the death of Christ. As they are the representations, so they are the purchase of that precious blood. As Christ is hereby set forth as crucified before our eyes, so are they the purchase of Christ crucified, so are they the gifts of Christ triumphant. Conquerors used, on the day of triumph, spargere missilia, to scatter gifts amongst the people. Answerably, the apostle represents to us Christ in his triumph, Ephesians 4, distributing gifts, becoming such a triumph, such a conqueror. Verse 8. When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. And those gifts, he tells us, verse 12, are public offices, and consequently public ordinances to be administered by those officers. How valuable are those ordinances, which are the purchase of that precious blood, which are the gifts Christ reserved for the glory of his triumph. Our final selection for this week comes from the pen of Peter Barnes, who is a member and an elder at Reevesby Presbyterian Church, New South Wales, Australia, where he also pastored for many years. Entitled Participating in Public Worship, this article first appeared in the July 2007 edition of the magazine, issue 526. Nothing could be further from the truth than the notion that the majority of the congregation simply sit in the pews while the preacher dominates proceedings in public worship. Obviously, as we're taught in 1 Corinthians 14.27, only one person ought to speak at a time. But that does not mean that others are thereby free to let their thoughts meander where they will. As we gather together as the covenant people of God, particularly on the day set apart to commemorate the breaking in of the new creation in the resurrection of Christ, how ought we to meet? Well, firstly, we must participate. In Psalm 122, verse 1, King David declared, I was glad when they said to me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. David was not a priest or a religious leader as such, but he was a believer, and he rejoiced to be found with the people of God. Centuries later, Nehemiah, as governor, could be found parading with one of the choirs at the dedication of the wall around Jerusalem, and we read of that in Nehemiah 12, 38-40. We do not know whether Nehemiah could hit a right note or not, but both David and Nehemiah were happy to be physically present at the public worship. Their bodies were there because their hearts were there. It was the false worshippers in Amos' day who could hardly wait for the Sabbath to be over so that they could get back to their dishonest business practices. Amos 8, 5. We are not to gather together to fill in time, to meet others, distract as many as possible, 
Rather, it's to be as William Cowper put it. Here may we prove the power of prayer, to strengthen faith and sweeten care, to teach our faint desires to rise and bring all heaven before our eyes. Daniel Rowland used to watch the Christians gather together during the 18th century revival in Wales, and his comment was, they brought heaven with them. A Christian does not go to church. Rather, the church meets to worship, to be encouraged, and to encourage, and to grow in love and good works. We all participate. But secondly, we must pray. Charles Spurgeon once told his congregation, May God help me if you cease to pray for me. Let me know the day, and I must cease to preach. That's how important prayer is. We need to pray that God will meet with us, that his word will speak to us, that we will be encouraged to press on in eternal things, and that our love for God and our neighbour will increase. When the spirit of prayer is absent, we lose sight of what the faith is all about. Moses would not go anywhere unless he was assured that God would go with him. We can read of that in Exodus 33. That is the attitude of the believer. It's the very presence of God that we desire above all else. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said that he could forgive a preacher almost anything provided he gave him a sense of God. That is where prayer is so vital. And then thirdly, we must listen with faith. The book of Hebrews exhorts us to press on and warns us with respect to the Old Testament covenant people of God that the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Hebrews 4.2 Faith is above all else believing what God says. In Ezekiel's day, God complained that people heard the prophet in the same way as they listened to a singer with a pleasant voice or to a capable musician. Ezekiel 33, 31-32 One of the more obvious features of the modern church scene is the inordinate emphasis on entertainment. What matters is not the messenger, but the content of the message. 1 Corinthians 2, 1-5 and 2 Corinthians 10:10. The Apostle Paul, for example, was not a rhetorician in the classical sense, but a passionate herald of the gospel of salvation. When we gather together, we come not to view a performance, but to hear the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4.11. And as we read in 1 Timothy 4.13, the preacher is to give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. And again in 2 Timothy 2.15, he is to handle accurately the word of truth. It is admittedly difficult to combine a submissive spirit with a discerning spirit, but we must attempt to do so. We are, as it were, not only to sit humbly at Jesus' feet and hear his word, but also to test the spirits, so that the human preacher may not lead us away from the divine word. See Acts 17.11, 1 Thessalonians 5.21 and 1 John 4.1. In 1630, while he was still a probationer, John Livingston preached in the Kirk of Shots in Scotland on the Monday after a communion season. Livingston was nervous to the point of being fearful, but he preached for well over an hour on the text Ezekiel 36, 25-26, where we read, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will put my spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. A remarkable awakening occurred, and in a day when the invitation system was not used, some 500 persons were to trace their conversions to that sermon. A week later, he preached the same sermon at Irvine, and nothing happened. In fact, he became so discouraged by this latter effort that he had to be cajoled to preach the following Sunday. Livingston learned this, and he wrote, I found that much study did not so much help me in preaching as the getting my heart brought to a right disposition. Yea, sometimes I thought that the hunger of the hearers helped me more than my own preparation. We're not in control here. 
We all must participate and all pray and all heed the word of God. But it is the presence of the Spirit of God that gives life to our worship of the living God. Thank you for listening to the Banner of Truth magazine podcast. To subscribe to the magazine in print or digital formats, or both, see the show notes or visit banneroftruth.org.